Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Live podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. Today, I am extremely excited to have on the show Paul Young. Paul has been an instructor here at Pragmatic for over 10 years. Uh, he has also, before that, held several different executive positions in product at some great companies. He is a longtime friend, uh, and he's also my partner in crime for uh, Price is Right, as we have done that together in Austin. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. All right. So I thought today, Paul, we go a little bit different, right? Instead of talking about a, a deep topic that we would talk about what products, what brands that we love, uh, and then maybe look a little bit about why we love those. What makes those different? What makes them so excited? How's that sound? That sounds great. I love talking about products that I love. That'll, that'll be fun. All right, cool. Let's start. What, give, me, give me a product that when you think about, you get all excited about, or that you like gush about to random people. Well, I don't know about gush about to random people, but uh, I'll start off with something that has kind of solved a very specific problem for me uh, during COVID. So, you know, as dur during this, you know, pandemic, like so many of us, you know, we, we pick up different hobbies, right? And we start doing different things. And I, and I took it upon myself <clears throat> about a year ago uh, when I started staying home more to really amp up my, my workouts and my, my routine so that I could, you know, eat healthier, feel better and so on. And so, uh, unfortunately the way that I would typically go work out, which would be to go play basketball, uh, got shut down because obviously, you know, you can't go be in a group setting indoors during COVID. So I had to find ways to work out just by myself. And I built a little, you know, gym in my garage that I go to, you know, pretty much every day now <clears throat> to figure out, you know, what, you know, what, what, what can I do? And I started weightlifting um, and I really got into, you know, Olympic lifts and, and, and so on. <clears throat> and one of the things that, uh, that I realized pretty quickly was while that I enjoyed it, uh, there were certain problems with it. You know, I have a, what's called a power rack, which is basically like a safety device that you can do your squats and so on in so that if you were to drop a really heavy weight, you know, it doesn't fall on you. It, it gets caught by the, by the rack. And so if you're squatting, like, like last week, I was able to get my squat up to 400 pounds, which is pretty good for me. Um, <clears throat> you know, you do a set of five of those squats and you're pretty tired. And so you put it back on the rack and you have to wait, you know, maybe three minutes, five minutes before you do your next set. And typically I would uh, set a timer on my phone, on my iPhone, and that's fine. Um, but what happens when you, you know, want to do other stuff, you know, on your phone, or maybe you just don't want to have your eyes on the timer, or you don't want to have it pop up? <clears throat> well, as it turns out, there's a little organization or a little uh, project that solved that problem of keeping your rest times um, <clears throat> between sets. And it was a project that I actually backed on Kickstarter uh, called Time Bird. Uh, and I think they're actually now gone to market after Kickstarter, and you can you can probably find it if you were to Google Time Bird. Um, but it's a little device, and it basically is very simple. It just has a screen um, with a countdown timer, like the old uh, digital clocks that you would see. And uh, it's got, it's not smart, it's not connected to anything, but you just control it with buttons on the top. And it's cool because it's really hefty, it's magnetic, and I can stick it to my rack. And whenever I get done with a set, I just hit a button and I've set my countdown timer for three and a half minutes and it just counts down. And, uh, and it gets my attention pretty loud by beeping uh, when I'm done with it. So it's basically like a really simple interval timer um, for your workouts. Um, and it solves a very specific problem for me. It's almost like somebody was reading my mind um, <clears throat> and they were following me around in my, in my home gym and seeing a problem that I had and they, they built a product specifically to solve that problem. So uh, it's one of my favorites just because it's it's not trying to be all things to all people. It's simple and it solves a problem that is relevant to me. And so, uh, yeah, that makes the list of one of my favorites. I love that example, right? I mean, there's so many that common ones you think of and 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 what makes that one so great is it is exact, it knows what it is and what it is, it does really well for those who need that. And I, I think it's so hard to not just keep adding features sometime uh, and not trying to be all things like, oh, I could also use this for X, Y, or Z, that that can feel like a really magic, simple piece. Absolutely. 
yeah, simplicity. And, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, pragmatic, we just introduced our, our first session uh, for design called uh, by the same title by design. Uh, and one of the big things that we uh, espouse in that session is that in order to design a solution that is applicable for your users, you have to understand what is their current experience look like. Uh, and there's a lot of tools you can use to do that, like personas and so on. But, but a really good one is experience mapping. Uh, to go through and map what does their current experience look like. I almost feel like the, the designers and the product team for Timebirds, they followed people like me through their workout routine and they mapped out their current experience and the struggles they were having to you know, keep a timer on their watch or you know, just looking at the clock or on their phone or whatever. And they said, aha, there's a better way to solve this problem than the current experience. And that's where this product feels like it was born out of. You know, that reminds me of an example I was just talking about someone the other day. It's not quite as, as sexy. It, it doesn't make me sound cool because I work out a lot. Uh, but <laughs> uh, TurboTax is one of those things that has come so far when you think about the online version. And it takes something that you don't do often, right? So you don't really get that repetitive skill at it. Uh, but that's always been really painful and really broke it down in the way that people think. Uh, and and made it just really easy for the typical taxpayer to use. Uh, and, and I think to your point, they did that by really watching how people did their taxes today. That's how they started, right? It was sort of like the automated version of your form. And then they really reimagined that instead of, okay, if you've entered the form like this before, forget that. What are you doing before you ever hit the form? What kind of questions are you asking yourself? What kind of information are you providing? And let's really help them at that stage uh, instead of just, here's a great online form. And, and I think it's uh, it's a great product for that reason um, in terms of trying to meet the user in the way that the user works. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you're a product manager, I mean, we're going to talk about a bunch of different examples of products that we think are interesting today or that we love. Uh, but I think the common thread, you know, whether you're product manager, product marketing, designer, executive, whatever, it is not just understanding, do we know what problem it's solving? Because that's like prerequisite for a product to be successful. But are they solving a problem in a compelling way that's better than your current experience? And that, that's what's really important. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, obviously nobody gets to that better state immediately. You get to that better state through prototyping, trial and error, you know, testing things out and, and so on, going through that MVP or product market fit same kinds of ideas. And so that, that whole process is, of innovation is not magic. It doesn't just happen. Uh, it starts with the product team doing their research, and then it extends all the way through the process of taking those problems through with your designers to do additional research, with your engineering team, with your executive and sales. Like sales is a great example. Like if you've got a sales team, do they go and talk to your buyers about, look at all these new features that we've added? Or do they go talk to your buyers about, we've detected some problems that people like you have, and we've figured out a compelling way to solve those problems. I mean, think about how much more powerful that is. It's a different skill set. Not every salesperson can maybe get there, but it's something that, especially when I think about B2B and enterprise, speaking to the problem is just so critically important. And I hope is a skill that product teams are helping their sales teams extend. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's so interesting about problem focus, right? We at, at Pragmatic on the, in the product division have always talked about it being, you know, product's role to identify and solve problems. But really those problems are sort of that, that common thread, that DNA that runs through every department and through the whole organization to make it successful. To your point, sales, right? Are you focused on the problems? Are you helping people identify them? Marketing, right? Marketing communications, do you know what problems you should be talking about? Who has these problems? How are you identifying the most, the most, um, the you know, the best target audience for you? All of that stems from problems. It's almost like this connective tissue or secret language. Mm -hmm. and, and what I always find <clears throat> super interesting is how you know people come to the the sessions that we lead, you know, here at Pragmatic, and you know, we're, this is not like proprietary stuff. Right, this idea we should focus on the problem. People say this in lots of different ways. You know, Christensen says it with jobs to be done. You know, there are other <clears throat> ideas around this, but like the, the the notion that we should focus on the problem is something that everyone knows, but not enough practice. 
um, because we get it's so easy when you're inside the building talking to engineers and executives and sales and everybody all day long to just get in love with and enamored with your features and technologies. And we see it happening all. I mean, it happened to me. It happened to me when I was a product executive. You know, I would I would get so like, ooh, ooh, look at this new widget that we created. Isn't this amazing? You know, we we spent the last you know 50 person years you know in our engineering team building this, and we have 75 PhDs you know, who put a collective 4,000 hours of experience into it. I mean, that's all wonderful, but guess what? Nobody cares unless it solves a problem. That's what matters. So that reminds me of one of my, my favorite products uh, and it ages me a little bit, but so I am a voracious reader. I love to read. I always have been. I always joke around. My husband picked me up for our very first date, uh, obviously before he was my husband. And I made him wait. Like he, I ent- answered the door and I had him sit down because I had like three pages left in my chapter. Uh, and he was like, that was, that's fine. He was totally cool with it. And I thought, ah, this is the guy, right? <laughs> so whenever we would go on vacation, I would bring seven or eight books with me for a week, right? Because if we're going to hang out by the beach, then that's what I'm going to do primarily is read. And more than once I had my suitcase flagged for weighing too much. And it was always books, 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 books. And then I would bring seven books and I'd run out of books. And then I'd have to go like to whatever the hotel lobby had. And so the Kindle for me solved a really big problem. Uh, and it, you know, one of the things that I love about it is, is the ease at which I can get it, but the reading experience is, is wonderful. It's not quite the same as curling up with a book, but it's totally different than reading a book on my, my tablet or my phone or my computer. It, it has a, it really thought that through, but for me, it was a true problem that I had <laughs> as a, a reading addict. And, and it just made everything so simple. It, it fit in my pocket practically. And I could carry a whole world's worth of, of books with me wherever I go. And I, I still use it today. I still prefer that to almost any other way. Uh, it's certainly to any other electronic way of reading. Um, and to your point, it, it, whether it's a Kindle fire, that's not for me. I like the, the e-reader. I like to just, it be only about reading books when I'm on there. You know, it's interesting that uh, you know, for me, it's very similar with the Kindle, right? It's a great, it's a great product. And you know, prior to COVID, when I was traveling all over the place every single week, you know, you got a lot of time on airplanes if you're an instructor. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of opportunities to read. Luckily, I like to read, and so it was the same thing. I had my Kindle, um, <clears throat> but eventually, I got sick of carrying my Kindle and my iPad, and so I just started using the Kindle app on my iPad. But as you were talking, what I realized is that. Sometimes the introduction of one product can create a problem that's new that you didn't foresee. Uh, And the problem that it created for me was by using the Kindle app on my iPad, uh, I actually would get distracted by all the other stuff I could do on my, so like I'd find Mm -hmm. myself like playing a game or reading a, you know, going away from my book to, you know, browse the web or just, I I actually, I will confess now that I, I, probably haven't finished. I have like seven books on my iPad that I've started, but not finished. So I've gotten really good at buying books from Amazon <laughs> to load up in my Kindle app, but not good at finishing them. I mean, like one of the other things about the Kindle that I just loved is, so I, I definitely prefer to read on the Kindle itself, but should you be stuck somewhere in line, I can open the Kindle app on my phone and it syncs up to where I was. Like, that's great. Otherwise, you know, you couldn't do that with a paper book. You have to have it with you. So yeah, my, my husband bought the Kindle Fire and I thought, yeah, he's never reading a book on that. He's always going to do something else. And he was like, no, I won't. And I'm pretty sure he also has several purchased books on there of which he's read three or four pages. So interesting. Well, the All next right. one on my list yeah. um, was let, let's, let's transition over to B2B a little bit more. So this is a product that's kind of new to me. But the first time I saw it, you, you ever had a product, the first time you use it, you just get it yep. right away. And it's like, wow. So for me, <clears throat> that product is uh, is Miro. Uh, and there's a competing product called Mural that's the same kind of idea. It's basically like a, what's called an infinite canvas tool. Um, so think of like a whiteboarding tool that you can use collaboratively and online. And uh, it's really neat. Our, our design partners... Um, <clears throat> Shannon and, and, and Jim Dibble, uh, Jim Dibble and Shannon McGarity uh, brought it to us when they, when they joined us over from, uh, from Cooper Professional Education, they introduced it to us. Um, but it's a really nifty tool because the first time I saw this, we had a group of, I don't know, a dozen people that were all trying to collaborate and we're doing it during COVID. So we're all in different places. 
Uh, we've got Zoom up in the background so we can see each other on video, but normally you would just talk or take turns talking, or maybe if you're lucky, you'd have a Google Doc where you're throwing ideas down or whatever. What this allows you to do is, is recreate that experience of being in a room and having a, a, a wall with you know sticky notes on it and being able to like gather the sticky notes. Everyone can work in this at the same time within the app and they can put their own sticky notes on, they can move them around. I can put one on and you can edit it or you can move it to a different spot. Uh, you can do shapes and arrows and drawings and it just as in terms of like a free form or brainstorming tool as a group within the first five minutes, I, I got it. And I was like, wow, this is like, where has the, where have you been my whole life? Um, I need, I need this in my life. And, and so I found all sorts of uses for it since, and I continued uh, to see uses for it going forward. So it's, it's one of those products that I, I love because it sol it definitely solves a problem, but I didn't know I needed it until I saw it. And <clears throat> sometimes I think a hallmark of a great product is like, you don't realize you have a problem until you see the solution. And then you're like, wow, that, that, that really just speaks to me. It works to me. It speaks to me at a very deep level. Miro uh, definitely fills that, that void for me. Oh, I'm, I'm right with you. And, and I think it's a reflection of the way too, that we like to think a ton of people on the the marketing team here uh, really like it as well for that brainstorming, the sort of lack of restrictions. It's great. Um, speaking of B2B apps, I'm going to give you one that I loved and now I'm not so sure. Right. Mm, okay. So those products, it's like the opposite of what you said, where you knew right away you loved it. Uh, and I did, but now, now I get somewhat frustrated and I apologize for all of those people who are listening, who will not agree with me. Uh, but Slack, right? So we'd been a, a big I am house for a long time. I, I like it when it started. I loved it, right? The ability to do really simple group conversations, the ability to flag notes to go back to, the ability to have channels and to change how you subscribe and the type of notifications you want. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Really loved how I could integrate into that, into Slack people from outside the organization as well, right? Uh, which is really great when you've got vendors that are sort of embedded. Um, the reason it frustrates me now is I lose conversations, right? Because I'll have I'll have a, a chain with let's, let's say you and I have a chain, and then you and I and, and Amy have a chain, and you and I and Amy and Jim have a chain, uh, and making sure that I post in the right one that includes the right people and that reply in the right one has has it's like I used it too much, uh, <laughs> and and now it has created problems I did not have before. I feel you. And I think a lot of people listening probably do as well. It's one of those things where Slack, when they came into the forefront of all of our minds a couple of years ago, the, the promise was this is going to be the next app that replaces email, right? Or replaces IM. And, you know, maybe, maybe for some people it does. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, what's happened is that it's become another layer of communications that sits on top of email and Zoom and everything else. And so now it's like, well, it didn't really replace email, it just gave me another app that I have to go constantly check and keep up with. And if you're in any a team of any size, there are conversations happening all the time that you now have to monitor. Because if you're not on there, things are gonna move forward without you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of date myself with this, but you know, back in early in my career, uh, when I worked at Cisco, in the, mm, let's say early 2000s, this is before iPhone, they handed out uh, Blackberries to everybody uh, who needed to be on like essential communications uh, for emails. And they very quickly got the nickname Crackberries um, because <clears throat> what would end up happening is email threads would happen at two in the morning and the executive team would be on there because they had their Blackberry. And if you weren't on it, then decisions were gonna get made and you wouldn't be in the loop. And so I still remember to this day um, the buzz that the BlackBerry would provide when I had in my pocket. And I one day was in a movie uh, with my wife. We were watching a movie and I felt a buzz in my pocket from the BlackBerry. And I got up to walk out of the movie theater to address whatever the critical, it had to be a critical issue, right? And then I got out to the lobby and realized I didn't have it in my pocket. It was a phantom buzz that came from, it was just like the muscle memory of, oh, I, I haven't felt it in a while, it must be there. And so that's when I realized, wow, this is like, it's solving a problem, but it's creating new problems too. 
No, I, I actually loved my BlackBerry uh, in terms of typing on the keyboard because I'm old. Uh, and so I like it was the original Blackberries had like the full uh, keyboard on there and not just like touch screen. So that's exactly. cool. that ages exactly. me as well. Yeah. So there's the products that are great until you use it too much. And I, I also wonder, I, I think uh, Slack, as we went full virtual, uh, added a different level of communication channels that you would not have gone through there. And I think Zoom is now kind of going through a similar transition. You know, when yep. when the pandemic first started, everyone's like, oh my gosh, thank you. We've got a we've got a tool now that we can all like still see one another and communicate and it's awesome and it does solve problems. But now people are starting to get to that fatigue mode where you know it's just a little bit tough. It's creating new problems, which is I guess any successful product, you know, even even Apple is seeing this with you know iPhone and the device addiction problems and so on, but it's just something to be aware of. Let's get back to the ones we love. Give me another product that you absolutely love. All right, so this one is, uh, I'm gonna go back to kind of personal stuff. That, so <clears throat> I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little under uh, six feet tall and I have always struggled, you know, with, you know, my, my, with my weight, with my body image and so on. For whatever reason, clothes off the rack do not fit me. Uh, at least they don't fit me well. I'll end up with shirts that are like really, you know, baggy or they'll just be like the sleeves are too long, too short, too whatever. And so a couple of years ago, my sister, who is one of the you know most stylish people I know, she hooked me up with a gift card um, to a company I'd never heard of before. Uh, it was a company called Jay Hilburn. And they've got a really interesting uh, model. Essentially what happens is they send out a... They call them a stylist, but basically it's a person who will come to your house uh, and take all of your measurements, just like a, a tailor would. And so they measure, you know, your chest, your arms, you know, your, your, your hips, everything else. And they input that into their system. And then you can go on their website and choose from all these different clothes. Some are, you know, nice business casual stuff that you would wear, like for me, if I'm teaching. Others are more casual, like hoodies and jeans and things like that. But when you order, they use all of your measurements to build it to your body. And so now I can go on Jay Hilburn website and I can order clothes. And when they show up, it's almost like they fit me like a glove because they're built for my body. And so I can put on a jacket and the first time I try it on, I'm like, oh, this is so nice. This actually fits me. And the same thing with, you know, slacks or, or shirts or whatever. And uh, not only that, it's built the way I like it, you know, to, to fit my body and look good. And so, you know, I, I, that's a product that I love and I always turn people on to, especially if they don't, if, if, if they don't find stuff that fits them off the rack, um, because there's nothing like that feeling of confidence that you get when you, when you look good, you feel good. Um, it, it comes through, you know, in your, in your public speaking for me, you know, when I'm presenting, uh, when you're working with your executive team or, or your peers, um, it's something I really enjoy. And I, I think, you know, we've got, we've all gotten pretty cash uh, during, during COVID, um, and I think that's, that's well and good, but, you know, as we start to transition back into the office, I think there'll be a place to step it up maybe a little bit. And a lot of people might be looking for that. So that's a, that's a product that I love. It really, uh, speaks, speaks to me and my needs. I am completely going to look that up after this, the, the things that fit, you know, not finding things that fit, but also being able to shop online to find things that fit because it's hard when I'm in the store, but I can try a bunch on and I'm a terrible person. And so if you send me something and it doesn't fit, I don't actually return it, uh, which is, because I don't know. I'm, I'm one of those people, right? So I, I end up donating them. So the idea that I could order online because I don't love to shop and that it would come and fit and be what I like is, uh, it solves like four problems for me. Yeah, check it out. Jay Hilburn, pretty pretty cool little uh, little company and little model. They're not the only ones. There, there's another one called Proper Cloth, and there's a couple others that do similar things. I think Jay Hilburn is mainly aimed towards men, but there's others that are aimed at women as well. So we've talked about a bunch of different products, uh, and along the way, we've talked about some of the things that have in common. But let's 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 close that loop of all the things we've talked about. We've talked about the your uh, was Time Bird. Uh, the Kindle, we've talked about, um, we've talked about Jay Hilburn and we've talked about Slack and we've talked about uh, a number of different things. And I think one of the things that you brought all of them back to was problem. Um, but then you also talked about, so the, I was gonna, I'm gonna go with the elegance of the solution to that problem. Um, what, 
what else do you think those amazing products have in common? What do we need to make sure our products have to make sure that our audience loves those and talks about them in a podcast? That's a great question. You know, what, one of the things that uh, our, our design team here at Pragmatic has really been good at, you know, helping me reinforce and, and learn, but also I think for our students as well, is the importance of designing for humans and realizing that your users, they're not you know, nameless, faceless people, uh, they're real life humans. They've got their own concerns. They've got their own backgrounds. They've got other things they're dealing with. You know, your product is not the only thing they care about. And so when I think of something that really resonates with me, you know, whether it's the examples I gave today or, or, or others, uh, they, they really fit into your life or your job in a compelling way. They solve problems, but it's not enough just to check a box to say you solved a problem. You solve that problem in a way that fits into your experience and your life and your job and your workflow and your routine. And so I think that, you know, we, we talk a lot about Nehito, nothing important happens in the office. And this notion that product manager should get out of the office, that's absolutely true. But you're not just a slug who's getting out of the office and sitting there in front of a user. What you're doing when you're sitting in front of that user is capturing in your notes, and in your, um, in, your, in your reflections, what does their life look like today so that we can map out their current experience and then create something that's better? That's the whole point. And so when I think about these, all these examples, plus ones that maybe those of you listening to this in the future are thinking about, <clears throat> I want you to think about a product that not just creates an emotional reaction with you, but one that when you think about how it solves a problem for you, it improves your workflow or your life in a really compelling way. And just to kind of wrap that up, I'll give you one final example. This one's really simple. This is not a whole product. It's a feature within a product. Um, <clears throat> so earlier today, I was loading up some, uh, some laundry and we have one of those uh, Samsung front loading washers and, and dryers. And while those are fine, I mean, they're a washer and dryer, right? How exciting can that be? Um, there's a feature in both the washer and the dryer that I found super compelling, at least for me. And that is when they get done with their cycle, it plays a song. And I could even like hum the song, I have it memorized because it's uh, it, it's kind of a happy little, you know, ditty that it, that it plays, but it's loud enough that I can hear it across the house. And I will admit that one of my problems is that I start a little laundry and then I forget about it. And then I get back to it a couple hours later and it's still kind of damp and I'm just like, oh, I wish I had remembered to move this over. And so somebody realized that people like me forget about laundry that they put in and they, uh, they built this thing that, that, that reflects my workflow of forgetting um, in such a way that it actually uh, notifies me loud enough that I remember it. And, I, and whenever I hear that song, I'm like, oh, I'm happy. The laundry's done. And I go over there and I, and I, and I move it to the next stage, which is something that, you know, it's, it's a feature within a product, but it, it really reflects that they did the research to understand me and, and what I need in order to get that, that chore done. Well, and, and again, to, to, to wrap up, right. It, it both, they understood the problem, but they found an elegant solution. It they wasn't did. the honking siren at you. It was something that you could hear that you would remember a piece. And, and I think that's why it's so important, right. To, to, to uncover the opportunities in the market that our company is the right one to solve. And then to create solutions that, as you said, embrace the user uh, and provide an experience that that fits within their overall journey anyway. Uh, and that's where I think you get the most innovative solutions, even if they're also the most simple. Absolutely, well said. All right, Paul, it is always great fun to talk with you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, look forward to the next time. Awesome, all right, that does it for today's episode. Thanks everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career.